welcome to Like a Store Miami and to Like a Lounge. My name is Josh Lehrer. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, good. I'm a Like a Specialist here at Like a Store Miami along with some of my colleagues who are here tonight, David, uh, Kirsten, and Lewis. He's, he's there. Um, how many of you are here for the first time? A lot. This is what I like to see. Well, welcome. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the Like a Brand or Like a Store Miami, we try to be more than a camera store. We try to be a place where you can come and be inspired, uh, inspired about your photography, inspired about the world of photography, not just the equipment, but the people and the artwork. And we encourage people to come and play with the cameras, try the cameras, experience Leica, especially if you've never experienced Leica before. We have all the toys out on display tonight, so when the lecture is done, we're happy to show you anything that you'd like to see. We do a lot of workshops, a lot of events, meetups. We have a full gallery here, as you can see, of Leica photography. We also have a customer gallery, sort of back that way, where we feature different customer, local customer work every few weeks. I first want to thank uh, Brooklyn Brewery, who is our alcohol sponsor for the evening. Please drink responsibly. If you don't, just don't tell me about it. Um, <laughs> the first thing I want to mention about Leica Store Miami, as I said, is how we have a lot more than just camera sales here. We have a number of workshops and meets and programs that we offer, like the Leica Lounge, uh, which we do the first Thursday of every month, where we feature a local photographer, someone in the world of, uh, of photography. And this is actually the first time Leica Lounge is going to be recorded and made available for free for everybody on the internet to enjoy. And we're going to make this a monthly thing. So if you can't make one, don't despair. Yes, we'll hate you, but you can watch it online later, so it's OK. Um, if you're interested in Leica and Leica photography, we have a few different events and things kind of happening around town. Uh, the first one's going to be we actually have a Leica club called Red Dot Miami. You can find us at uh, facebook.com slash red dot Miami, where we do photo walks and meets. And we're going to have a lot of cool stuff coming up in uh, 2016. So Saturday, March 12th in Wynwood is our first photo walk, which Everyone is welcome to attend. Uh, again, Facebook is the best place to find that out. Uh, March 31st, we have the Matt Stewart Gallery opening here at night. And then the next few days, we actually have a workshop with Matt Stewart and the Leica Academy. There are still some spots left, I think, right, David? Um, so that would be April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. We're doing a workshop in Florence, Italy, with Adam Morelli. We have a couple of spots left. That's in May. And we have, I think, one spot left for Art Wolf in the Olympic Peninsula in June. So if you go to likeastormiami.com, you can see the workshops that we do, destination workshops, local workshops, the talks and the meets that we have here as well. We do have a very nice newsletter that my colleague Kirsten works very hard on every month. Um, there's an iPad right here. We're going to pass it around. If you want to sign up for the newsletter, enter your email. And just once a month, all of our promotions, events, gallery openings, everything like that. Um, that being said, as I said, this is the Like a Lounge, and this month we are featuring Louis J. Uh, I first met Louis about six years ago when I started here. Actually, one of the first Leica Academy programs that was hosted in Miami was at his studio, and that's how we met and our relationship started, and it's been a great six years uh, since. Uh, Louis really epitomizes the definition of an international artist. Born in Philadelphia, studied photography first in London, then moved to New York City, where he studied cinematography at the NYU Graduate Film Institute, um, then working as a professional photographer, videographer, <coughs> jack of all trades. After New York City, he spent a few years in Rio, and you're actually going to see some of his amazing uh, Rio de Janeiro photography tonight. He speaks fluent Portuguese and some French, if I recall, and probably English, I hope. <laughs> uh, <laughs> aside from that, so a few years in Rio. After Rio, he came back to Miami, started working here as a advertising, editorial photographer, working his way into the scene, winning awards, having gallery shows. In early 2000, start of the millennium, opened up Studio 27, which is where we met, ran a successful photo studio in Miami for a number of years, sold it in 2011 uh, to pursue sort of his personal work, and has been traveling around photographing and making work ever since. And uh, with that, Louis J. So as uh, Josh mentioned, um, <clears throat> I was born in Philadelphia. I'm just going to say a few brief words about my background uh, and grew up there. Um, 
My father was a very, very good amateur photographer, and he gave me my first camera when I was about nine years old. So I got interested in, at an early age then. Um, I studied and received a degree at Penn State University in communications. Uh, there I dabbled in 16 millimeter, um, making some short 16 millimeter films uh, and TV production. I, I actually wrote and produced a video documentary on early New Orleans jazz. Um, around 1975, about a year after graduating university, I moved to London and there I decided to enroll in the photography program at a place called Harrow College of Art, just outside of London. Um, I had brought with me my, uh, a Nikon camera that my dad had just uh, had given me, and I also bought my first Leica, an M4, which I picked up at a second-hand shop in the old city of London. So it's really in London, um, where I kind of uh, got my start in, in photographing uh, the types of things that I like to photograph, um, which I call urban landscapes, which for me is really the interaction of people and places uh, in cities. You know, it, it could be uh, people in parks, uh, monuments, uh, pubs, bars, cafes, uh, I, I like this interaction of, of light and people, and sometimes just the, the architectural elements which make cities so great. Um, so it was basically uh, uh, there in London that I started walking around with my uh, Leica, with usually black and white film. Um, uh, whenever I could, when I wasn't in school, I, I, I tried to uh, hit the streets, as they say. Uh, the interesting thing was London at this time was, it was a very exciting time uh, around the mid-70s uh, as punk music and reggae started to appear on the scene. Um, London was kind of going through a second wind of energy after the famous uh, swinging 60s. So uh, besides studying and, and in this place, I was able to... Uh, meet some interesting people, uh, ended up in a recording session with Bob Marley and the Whalers, which is a whole other story, um, and kind of got my, my start. Um, but as things turned out, I only stayed in Harrow College for a year, because really I just wanted to learn black and white film developing and, and printing. I wanted to learn some basic technical skills, and I already had a bachelor's degree. So I really didn't care about getting another one. And uh, at this time, I was also very passionate about cinema, uh, and I wanted to do film. So I applied to NYU Graduate Film Institute, which at that time was considered one of the best film schools in the States. Uh, and uh, I left London at the end of the 70s and, uh, because I was accepted there and moved back and settled in New York. Uh, I arrived in New York in the beginning of the year, in, in just after January, and as most school programs like NYU Grad Film start in the fall, I had this chunk of time really on my hands to do something. So uh, I decided to apply to a special course that they gave at uh, Parsons, in New York, Parsons, the new school, that the photographer, Lisette Modell, uh, ran during some semesters. Uh, the course was limited to about 12 people and you needed to have an interview with her and show her some of your work. It was, I was very happy to be accepted. Um, Lisette was an incredible woman. She was of Austrian descent and she really was known for um, her body of work in Paris and in the Riviera in the 1930s. The series of incredible black and white portraits uh, depicting contrasting economic times in places like Nice of, of wealthy people and then beggars, which uh, wasn't really photographed too much uh, at that time. Um, but with the advent of World War II coming 
she and her Russian painter husband uh, moved to New York where she eventually did uh, magazine work um, for some of the different uh, photo type magazines that featured photography at that time, including PM, uh, Picture Magazine. When her work started to dry up in the, in the 1950s um, and slow down, the photographer Ansel Adams uh, convinced her to teach. So she started teaching this master's program um, at the new school, um, Parsons. She was the mentor to Diane Arbus, who took the same course, the same class, some years before at the end of the 1950s. Uh, Lisette really didn't deal with technical issues. She assumed that her students were proficient in these matters. She dealt with your images, finding out who you are and what you want to say as a photographer. And her motto was, photograph only what you're passion, passionate about. So Lisette, Lisette Modell was really my first mentor. Um, <clears throat> So basically, uh, after taking this and, and continuing to photograph in New York, um, I started my program at New York University Graduate Film Institute, where I specialized in cinematography. Um, there I found my second important mentor, my cinematography professor, a guy named Beta Botka, who was, uh, Beta was a brilliant man uh, who taught me a lot about lighting, and aesthetics and, and, and many things. He was Czech and he had shot uh, over 40 films there under their state cinema. He got out in 1968 in that wave, with that wave of artists who, who had left after the failed revolution against the Soviets. Uh, so it's shame, I don't have a photo of uh, Beta, but um, at NYU, we basically crewed on each other's films, and, and there I met some very, very talented people, including the film director, uh, Jim Jarmish, and Spike Lee. We were all classmates together at different, different years. Um, in fact, I was the assistant cameraman for Jim Jarmish's first major film called Permanent Vacation. Uh, so while I was in my first year at NYU, a third year student named Howard Bruckner was directing a documentary about the writer William Burroughs, who was his neighbor. Howard had asked me to uh, work on the film during an event that was honoring Burroughs in a theater in the East Village. Uh, the event was called the Nova Convention, and uh, it happened during two evenings. Basically, they invited a lot of incredible writers and artists and colleagues of Burroughs um, to honor him. And some gave readings and others spoke about his influence on American literature. So I was asked to run uh, the offstage equipment room to basically hand out fresh loads of film magazines and batteries for the four 16 millimeter cameras that Howard had positioned around the theater uh, to cover the entire event. So I was able to take my Leica with some black and white film and get some shots at that time. <clears throat> um, it was uh, during the film assignment that I was able to meet some of the other writers, like the beat poet Allen Ginsberg, and gain access to take his portrait. This was taken in his East Village uh, apartment. Um, So all during my days at film school, I continued to photograph in New York. Um, a bunch of us from film school uh, took an afternoon off to see some of the films of the great American photographer, well, originally Swiss-born, Robert Frank, who was an idol to so many of us. Uh, most people know, you know, Robert Frank's work from his groundbreaking book, The Americans, which really shook up the whole um, photography world in the uh, uh, 50s. Uh, but he was also an interesting filmmaker, uh, very avant-garde and, and very different. Uh, so this was during one of the screenings uh, at the Whitney Museum where I grabbed this and 
Fortunately, I brought my copy of The Americans and he signed it for me, which I treasure to this day. Um, this is a young Spike Lee, classmate of mine and fellow teaching assistant in front of the, uh, our building. Uh, so basically, after I graduated, um, I kicked around New York for a little while working in the film scene as a uh, assistant cameraman, mostly on low budget commercials. Uh, my hope was really to eventually become a cinematographer. I wanted to be a DP or a director of photography, but the union uh, was a very, very difficult thing in New York at that time, and you had to basically uh, uh, put in your time as a second assistant cameraman for a few years and then move up to a first assistant cameraman, and then maybe after many, many years, you could become a camera operator, uh, you know, to eventually hopefully get to the coveted spot of director photography. But I was very impatient, and after a while, I decided, okay, uh, this wasn't for me, so I kind of went back to photography and uh, opened up my first studio in New York, and I became a commercial photographer, which is everything what we said, Modell said to me, don't do. She said, drive a taxi, okay, do anything but stay pure, but I just wasn't cut out to drive taxis and uh, I decided to do that. But I, I never lost, you know, uh, the interest in doing personal projects during this time. So my first personal project, which resulted in an exhibit, um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. These are just some more shots from New York from around that time, from the late 70s. Uh, and my first trip to Brazil, which we'll get back to. My first trip to South America, which took me to Rio de Janeiro and uh, Salvador Bahia. And uh, Buenos Aires. And then later I did a little trip to uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. But after um, uh, film school and, and this trip to South America, which was in a summer uh, of time off from film school and getting back and then doing the assistant cameraman uh, thing for a while, eventually, as I said, I got back to uh, still photography, which resulted in um, my first project and my first exhibit, a one-man show, it was called Cafeteria Portraits from Dubrow's, okay? And um, for those of you who might not even understand what a New York cafeteria was, I'm, I'm gonna see if I could set up the whole, the whole um, scene for you here, okay? The New York cafeteria was really a unique place, okay? They were popular places to eat reasonably and uh, there were a lot of them in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s in New York City, uh, in all the boroughs, Manhattan as well. But by the 1970s, there they were really only a few left, okay? Um, there was another famous one over on Park Avenue South called the Belmont, and that's the one where Martin Scorsese shot parts of Taxi Driver with De Niro as the taxi driver in there, okay? But um, I was basically um, walking in my neighborhood. I, I had an apartment in Chelsea, and I was walking up Broadway, and I ventured into Dubrow's, which was this incredible, incredible place. Um, the, the other thing that made, um, you know, cafeteria so different was that the whole modus operandi of the service was completely different from a restaurant. There were no waiters. You basically entered the place, um, you got a ticket, you entered a line, and you got a tray, and all the food was kind of in front of you, like a big buffet, and they handed you, okay, I'll have the, um, this fish dish or a salad or whatever, and uh, you would pay and sit down at a table, any table, most of the time sharing it with others. So it was this really very, very different way of eating, and like I said, it was very popular in New York. Um, so this is the outside. Uh, what really attracted me to, uh, 
to, uh, to this place where, where the faces. Um, just incredible people that I saw in there. Uh, the um, people who frequented Dubrow's, okay, were, was an interesting mix from people from all over the nearby garment industry. It was up at 38th and Broadway and the entire rag trade or, or garment industry was right there. So you would get this incredible mixture of um, exec well-dressed executives. Um, you'd also get tradespeople like uh, cutters and furriers and such. So it had this very democratic feel. It wasn't you know, an upmarket or, or a classist kind of thing. You, know, you, you would get all types. And then add to it, you, know, you would have shoppers and just you know, retired people. Um, who would come there and just seem to hang out uh, for hours at a time sometimes. You know. The famous Jewish writer Isaac Singer, who lived in New York and, and wrote about his life in Poland and New York, he had a name for these types who, who just hung out in there and he called them cafeteria nicks, which was kind of funny. But add to it the physical place itself was just incredible. You know, it, the interior was from the 1930s. It was very modernist and it had this huge three-story high atrium. Um, there were these very curvaceous soffits for decoration. And uh, there was this incredible futuristic large mural which dominated one of the walls. Um, so basically, I ended up shooting there for a year. Um, going there whenever I could and, and, and ending up having quite a lot of lunches there myself. I decided to use an old Rolleiflex twin lens reflex camera, which is square, and that's why the images are in square. Um, and uh, I thought it would really suit the type of shooting I would need to do there. You know, with the Rolleiflex, you have the waist level viewfinder, which you could easily shoot without bringing the camera straight up to your eye like a 30, most 35 millimeter cameras. And so while it wasn't exactly um, stealth, I think it was much less aggressive than you know, shooting in the other style. Uh, incredible thing about this work and this exhibit is that some of the faces are still very, very haunting uh, in a way for me as sometimes I would be sitting right across the table from an individual, okay? And this particular man glanced at my camera and then engaged me in conversation. He mentioned Brunschwig, which is the name written on the taking lens of my Rolly camera. Brunschwig was a city in Germany where they had made it, where they made Rolly flexes, okay? And then he started to recount his time there in Brunschwig during World War II working in a slave labor camp. So he turned out to be retired from a leather business, and he loved to come to the city and have lunch there. So for me, it wasn't just a lot of different faces, but a lot of them engaging me and me talking to them and really getting to know uh, their stories. Uh, and I know for sure that I photographed a few concentration camp survivors in there. In fact, I found out later that there was an Isaac Singer short story called Cafeteria, uh, and somebody adapted and made a short film using this cafeteria. The story was basically about a group of survivors who met every day in the cafeteria to drink coffee and discuss their lives. Uh, this gentleman, for example, would come in late morning, nurse a cup of coffee, his name was Joe, and all the locals called him Broadway Joe, and whenever I sat near him, this became the poster uh, shot for the exhibit, by the way, um, he would chat me up photographically because he was a retired photographer. He said he was like a AP uh, Associated Press stringer. You know, he, he said he got a lot of fires and things like that and sold to Daily News and uh, the tabloids in New York at that time. Uh, and they basically, the local, Everybody in there dubbed him Broadway Joe. He's a very, very nice guy. Um, oh. 
So this was basically a year of hanging out and, and shooting the people in there. So um, just a little while after uh, doing this project uh, and working in New York, um, I ended up in the uh, mid-80s moving to Rio de Janeiro. I had a lot of uh, friends from my London days who were in this associated metiers, uh, graphic design and uh, artists and everything, and I had visited as some of the earlier photos before um, Rio back in uh, 19, late 70s. And uh, I was starting to get a little bit burnt out on Manhattan. It's a wonderful place, incredible place to, to, to study and, and grow and work. I opened my first studio there. But on a, another trip down there, uh, people started inviting me to work on some projects. Hey, you want to do a record cover? Do you want to do this? So uh, long and short of it is I moved down there. Uh, in the mid-80s, and I fell in love with an um, incredible historic Bohemian neighborhood near the center of the city called Lapa, which uh, I think became kind of more gentrified today, but in, in those days uh, it was a place of hustlers and there was a thriving red light district uh, for every kind of persuasion, um, and there were um, local gamblers and, and the people who ran the local lottery, which is called Joga de Bichu, you know, based on animals and whatnot, uh, would frequent the bars and everything. So it was a very interesting, and the, and the architecture had something that other parts of the city had lost. I mean, it was very layered, and it was s some of the original parts of the city, um, whereas, uh, the other areas, like where I lived in, in, in Ipanema and later um, Lemmy in what they call Zona Sul, was really developed more after the war in, in the um, 40s, 50s, 60s and such. So for this project, I, I made a complete departure from what I did before. I chose color because for me it was an important element of the place and I really wanted a lot of detail uh, this is the days before digital, so the only way I wanted, I was offered a show after starting the project at a um, museum and theater complex that the uh, city of Rio opened right on the most beautiful street in Rio, the most expensive real estate avenue, Avenida Virasota, which is the beach street in Ipanema. So they opened up this place called Casa Cultura Laurel Vine, and the curator of art and photography offered me the exhibit, and, and I was the first photo show when they opened, and I decided right away I wanted to use, make really big prints. So I decided to embark on this project using four by five inch film, large format, a, a field camera um, shooting color negative. Uh, because I, I wanted to be able to print big and show all the details. There's this great viaduct running right through that the trolley takes people up to a neighborhood called um, Santa Teresa, which was very much part of it. So, I really love the interaction, not just of the architecture and the place, but you know, a lot of these are like incredible street scenes to me of movement of the people and the types is, is really what attracted me. The mixture of the human element with um, the building. This is obviously a hotel by the hour <laughs> that there were 
many of them. You know, in, in the, the interesting thing, uh, there was a curious thing about walking around uh, this neighborhood with a large camera and a tripod, okay, and planning it down in front of a house or a building or a street scene. You know, um, in the beginning, a lot of people, uh, when I first started photographing, a lot of people were very curious about me and what I was doing. You know, in fact, a couple times some people came up to me and they said, um, you know, that they knew I was that street survey guy. You know, they saw the tripod and they equated it with the guys doing surveys, uh, which was kind of funny. But after a while, people saw me in the neighborhood and, and, and I just kind of like blended in, which was kind of interesting from such a large presence of a camera, a bellows camera and, and, and changing film holders and all that from, you know, the normal method of being shooting with a light portable camera like a Leica, which is so good for that. So I was just kind of curious uh, how that worked. These are the kind of moments which, which I, I look for and adored. Like this is a typical, uh, what they call buchiquin, a little tiny cafe, which at the end of the day, so, the sun is so strong, they're putting the shutters down. And just the, the interaction of the pattern and the light, it just really what I loved about it. Still used to see a lot of uh, Volkswagen Beetles at this time. It was like the most popular car in Brazil. Very inexpensive, easy to fix. This shot actually, um, the last of the uh, non-people, non-portrait ones, uh, was early morning. Like I got up very early, it was like six o'clock, the sun's coming up, it's backlight. Uh, and this is something where the influence of my favorite French photographer, Eugene Aget, rubbed off on me because he practically only, only photographed by backlight. And he was the great documentary photographer of Paris at the turn of the century of 1800s and 1900s. So this was kind of like, for me, an homage to Eugene Aget. And I, I also grabbed uh, some interesting faces. And there was a whole different salon, a room, where I had blown up um, locals. This is a um, garlic vendor, you know, vendedor de alho. This is a, you know, tire boy, a buhachero, you know, who you'd pull in to the place and, you know, just some incredible faces, just a couple passing by. This is a typical Brazilian character you call malandro, kind of the hustler and <laughs> full of the attitude and on the make and it's a great figure. I had a lot more, I'm just showing a sampler, a sampling of them. Uh, this is a cart guy who would transport stuff for you. This is um, a lady of the evening <laughs> and she agreed to pose. And this is just a really nice mother and son front of their house. Um, yeah. So basically, um, I lived in Rio for about five years. Uh, I was doing advertising work down there. I was doing record covers. I also did some editorial work. I worked for the Brazilian edition of Interview Magazine. I was doing portraits of architects and interior designers and artists and interesting people like that, and a lot of ad work, mostly that. Uh, and around 1991, I moved back to the States. Things had gotten really, really bad. It was one of the worst phases in Brazil. My studio was knocked off. I lost a ton of equipment. That's where they got my first Leica, my M4, 
So that was gone. Uh, so I decided, you know, uh, it was time to really get out. As much as I loved the place, so I moved to Miami, uh, opened up a studio in the design district and continued doing advertising work. So uh, my career really in Miami was mostly about the ad work and as Josh had presented me uh, around just after the millennium, around 2001, I opened up a production facility, kind of a rental studio for other photographers in Wynwood called Studio 27 uh, and that about, had about a 10 year run. Uh, and uh, in 2011, I sold it. Someone came along and wanted to buy it. Uh, nothing to do with production. So it made me the proverbial offer I couldn't refuse. And I, I decided, okay, my, my days, that is done. So I was able to get back to what I started out doing. And I traveled back to Rio uh, in 2011, 2012. Um, 2013. So I did a series of trips back to start a project of rephotographing Rio. So I kind of, this is kind of like a full circle. Um, this time I was using a modern digital camera. I started with a, a Leica M9, which was a Leica I had at that time. And uh, this is that work. I started out um, trying to show here, and, and it's a work in progress. I would like to get back and continue. Uh, the contrast between what they call Zona Sul, the south zone where the affluent areas of Copacabana is here with the famous mosaic on, on the beach uh, sidewalk, okay, and uh, the less fortunate parts of, of Rio, the favelas, which there are many. So this is all Zona Sul, the uh, popular football team flag of Flamingo, which is, um, and just roaming around Copacabana. And then now in Ipanema, in the rock area and the surfers beach, Arpoador, where some favela guys would come and hang out as well. So you go from that to some surfers. Uh, this is the famous canal that separates uh, Ipanema and Leblon, the next very affluent area. And all that dirty water from Lagoa that they're having the hard time with the Olympics now with the aquatic events goes out into the sea. Uh, Ipanema at the end of the day. And now I spent, at that time I spent a lot of time going up to the largest favela in Rio, the largest favela in South America called Rocinha, um, which is a city unto itself. People there don't even know how many. It, the lowest estimate I heard it's about 140,000 people live there and then some people say no it's 200,000. So it's just incredible. Um, I was fortunate because I got there at a time when the favelas were being pacified because of the upcoming World Cup and now the coming Olympics. The, uh, they were so bad when I lived there that it was very difficult to go up into them, um, especially with equipment. But I was able to get a, a local guy who I became friends with and, you know, I, I did a lot of shooting there. And I have to say, that most of the people there are just fabulous. You know, they're, they're humble, they're really, really nice. But, of course, there was a large element which caused all the problems of the drug, drug trafficking which made the favelas so infamous. It's just incredible um, as you start to go up uh, because most of the favelas are built on these hills where no one else wanted to be. 
You know, they, they started a lot of them uh, after World War II in the 40s and 50s and became overpopulated and people just building on top of each other. And as you go up and continue to spiral your way up, you see it's a world of commerce. You know, they have their own barber shops and butchery shops and bars and it's just an incredible world up there. This guy was an incredible guy. He ended up uh, starting to talk to my guide, so he was distracted, and I was able to really just go shooting him um, in every which way. And he, he basically was the money lender, one of them, of the favela. You know. What's that? Uh, no, I don't think. Similar, the same, the shorts. Oh, oh, no, 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 totally different guy. That guy was just a local guy in Lapa, and um, yeah, right, two different people, yeah. This is their plumbing system, you know, PVC improvised, and the electrical is also very haphazard. Uh, now I'm back in the center of the city, and it's just interesting how this kind of mode of, of carrying things is still very much uh, in use there. And I leave it with a shot of surfers um, at back kind of where, where I started in Ipanema at um, the Surfers Beach. Um, they were just kind of having a little chat and. I just caught this incredible light. Um, so now, basically, what I've been doing, uh, really since selling Studio 27, has just been traveling between Rio and recently a lot in Paris. Uh, Paris and Italy, where my wife and I like to go a lot in the Campania or in Amalfi. So um, my most recent phase is really about that in both color um, and black and white. This is actually in Oxford a few years ago. Um, and then shifting, that's uh, a shot in Rome from a few years ago. This was an incredible day because it was November 1st, which in Italy and a lot of Catholic Europe, or a lot of Europe, or a lot of Catholic countries is uh, All Saints Day, Tutti Sante. So Rome, which normally has, I don't know what they say, on any given day there might be 100,000 tourists in Rome, together with the locals, just streamed down this street that led to the Spanish Steps. So, and it was pouring rain. So I got there and originally, oh, okay, I'll, maybe I'll photograph the Spanish Steps, but for me the shot was this, turning and just getting the sea of umbrellas and, and, and <laughs> The, the guy is the focal point, so. Uh, this is in Amalfi, uh, Italy, in their great cathedral, which had all this great, you know, Moorish type themes. This is in Ravello on another rainy day, I'm coming down the steps toward me. And this is in Positano, Italy. Now we go to Paris in the Marais, an area I like to photograph a lot. This is a bridge very close to the Cathedral Notre Dame at night um, with a couple of lovers. And uh, the Rodin Museum. Yeah, I, I, I love photographing Paris. It's a city I love. Um, uh, but for all its uh, physical beauty, what I really admire in it, you know, its culture, its history, of course it's, it's, it's physical beauty, but at the same time I think it's really a challenge to capture something original. You know, it, it really 
Um, Paris was the muse of so many great photographers, like Agé, the guy I quoted before, Cortez, you know, Cartier-Bresson, Robert Duaneau, and, and, and Willie Ronis, to name a few. So they really captured the city so well, and I'm just trying to do what I can. This is in uh, Versailles. This is the uh, French Senate in the background at the, between the guy's legs. Uh, <laughs> at the, in the Jardin Luxembourg. On the scene. So I'm, I'm there now uh, because we live uh, about six months a year in, in many different seasons. And I, I really, what attracts me is, again, is this interaction of, of, of people, um, these incredible places, and, and, and the light in general. This is the, at the Palais de Tokyo in the Trocadero neighborhood, and this incredible young woman was just walking, and I was almost like running to keep up after, and I said, oh, you know, who dresses like this anymore? You know, it's, you know, so someone saw it and said, you know, this is like a fashion shot, but I, I really wasn't intending, you know, like throwback to, the 50s or something, but it's just reality. Um, found this marvelous old English woman, um, delightful, in a cafe um, in the 16th, uh, right near uh, Avenue Victor Hugo. And I know she was English because it was a British newspaper, and she was having her daily constitutional, her afternoon drink. This is in the Marais as well. It's a woman who just started dancing uh, by the, on the edge of the Ile Saint Louis, which is another favorite walking place of mine. Uh, and uh, she would put music on, I think it was Edith Piaf, and just start twirling around. This is my favorite bridge, the uh, Pont Neuf, which is the New bridge, but is actually the oldest bridge in Paris, um, which I love these faces on the bridge in the uh, Jordan Luxembourg. the railroad yards near um, the Gare Saint-Lazare. This is one of my favorite um, big brasseries in Paris, La Coupole, which is, uh, has so much history. It was the place in the late 20s and 30s that Man Ray hung out in and a lot of great artists um, because they lived in that neighborhood of Montparnasse. And I've always found it a very interesting people watching place and I was able to just get this incredible scene one night uh, in there. And another large people scene in the Gare de Lyon, which is the train station taking people to the south and one summer trip there. And a couple color shots just outside. This is South Beach, Miami Beach, uh, the famous diner. And, you know, I think one of the most important things for me as an urban photographer, um, sometimes people talk about it, is just um, patience, you know. And I basically was with my camera and, and just waiting for interesting people to go by. As just the diner, it's okay, it's interesting, it's kind of cool, it's, you know, Art Deco diner and all that, but the people really made the shot, and uh, it, I couldn't have art directed them any better in their positions and <laughs> movement. It was just uh, fortuitous, really. 
There's South Beach as well. And one last shot in color. This is just um, in West Hollywood, uh, out on a trip to LA. And I was walking and caught this incredible building, which was the Paul Smith store there in West Hollywood. And, uh, you know, um, I just like the lines and the color. And now we shift to black and white, my most recent stuff. Um, in South Italy as well, a little town near Amalfi called Atrani, which some say is the smallest town in Italy. This was a, uh, I spend so much time in Amalfi, sometimes going, we go twice a year, that you start to know the locals very well. Uh, and there was this incredible old woman um, and I was really just, I don't want to say stalking her, but I was following her around, hoping to get a moment, and I just got lucky. She just kind of appeared in the frame, and there she was. This is all Italy. Lemon vendor. A local fisherman was just walking right at me. These were the um, chambermaids in the hotel where I was staying, and I just convinced them to come out and let me photograph. And uh, I just love their faces. Now we're in Paris again. This is uh, walking through the Tuileries in one evening. Sun was kind of setting. It was summer. This is a, a shop window in Place Vendôme, the beautiful high-end jewelry district of Paris. And I was very fortunate because it was Sunday. There wasn't, you know, a lot of movement, and I was able to get the whole window with these incredible reflections. Uh, and this is something which, uh, again. Ajay did for the first time. No one really photographed windows before him, but in the early 20th century, he, he really wandered around Paris beside his parks and his street scenes and cafes and his architectural stuff. He was really um, the first to do this. And years later, in the 50s, Lisette Modell, the woman I studied with, um, she did a whole series of New York um, windows. in the um, Place de Vosges, in the Marais, in one of the oldest uh, parts of Paris, and one of the oldest buildings, actually, from the beginning of the development of the city. This is the um, exit to the uh, Cathedral Notre Dame. This is on near where we live on the Champs Elysees. Uh. <clears throat> this is a, a, a funny story. I call him the dog walker of the Tuileries. Um, I had run into this guy in my stays and my travels in Paris numerous times. And I could never get the shot because he's moving very quick. And he would have this whole entourage of dogs. And I was just, got lucky. Again, in the right place, right time. Um, it was a little tricky light. You'll have these very white dogs and very dark ones. But 
um, I was able to finally uh, capture this guy in the whole entourage of the dogs. This was in the Marais. Uh, the funny thing was on the shot, I was uh, actually killing time. I had a prepaid printout ticket to go to the Picasso Museum nearby in the Marais. So I was walking around um, with my Leica, my black and white Leica, and uh, I saw this really interesting intersection which happens in the Marais. Uh, this juxtaposition of the streets and the curves. And then out of the corner of my eye, I see the guy on the left with the walking stick. I said, okay, that's going to make it even better, okay? So I started clicking, and before I even knew it, the guy in the bike came right at me. So, you know, obviously luck, I'm not going to say different, uh, does have a certain uh, element when you're doing this kind of urban photography. I think you just have to be prepared for it. You know, everybody fell in line. Again, I couldn't have art directed the space any better. You know, it's just this is actually in the Picasso Museum. Uh, little scene. I just like the light and the portrait of the guy, and then the legs behind him. This is on Rue de Rivoli. It's a cafe scene um, near the uh, Palais Royal. And I love these kind of scenes like the um, La Coupole scene and the train station scene because there's so much going on in it that for me is kind of relevant, you know. It's really, you know, urban life. Families conversing, people taking coffee, eating. This is actually not in Paris, it's a staircase that I fell in love with. Uh, in my uh, brother and sister-in-law's house in Saint-Tropez. The house was, I think, from the 1920s and there's something incredible about it. And I think my love for these kind of details, once again, comes from uh, an interest in Age, who photographed door knockers and staircases and all these incredible details in Paris, beside the bigger views. And this was a um, condemned house in Saint-Tropez where I just kind of stuck the camera and the lens through a broken window and was fortunate to get a kind of interesting light. This is a triptych uh, that I decided to take. I was at the um, famous art fair they hold every year in November in Paris, the um, Paris Photo. And I was really fortunate because the fair opens on a Wednesday. It runs Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I was going to go Wednesday and I put it off and I ended up getting my ticket and printing it out for Friday. Well, as it turned out, it was the last day because the 2015 attack that happened this last year in Paris happened that Friday night and they closed the fair down two days early. Uh, which is a shame. But there's something incredible about the Grand Palais was built in 1900 for the big World's Fair there, where they showcase the Tour Eiffel, uh, or as we call here, the Eiffel Tower, and, and the Petit Palais across the street. And it's really just this incredible uh, palace of glass and iron, you know, steel. It just, so, uh, I thought it made more sense putting the images together as a triptych. You know, um, the interesting thing about doing this kind of stuff as it relates to the people and the other stuff is that for some photographers there's really no difference. I remember um, Ralph Gibson, the um, great photographer, he always said that um, there's kind of a link between photographing the human form 
and architecture. And he said, if you could photograph the body and you could photograph architecture, you could really basically photograph anything. You know, you'd be well equipped. <clears throat> I end on um, an interesting story of the modern times. Uh, I always admired the um, gargoyles of Notre Dame. You know, I admire them from on the ground. But I wanted to get up there and photograph them. Um, one of the photos of which it's been photographed by a lot of great ones, which always stood out in my mind, was the one of Cartier-Bresson got, which was probably in the, after World War II, was probably in the late 40s or 50s, of a bunch of school kids up on one of the um, towers there in the uh, middle ground, the view of Paris is in the background, and a couple of lovers in the foreground. You know, so one day, uh, I waited in line. There's a separate line. There's the main line that all the tourists go, go into the cathedral on the ground floor. But to get up into the towers, um, you wait about 45 minutes in line, and then you start to walk up these narrow ancient steps. So I got up there, and I was kind of totally devastated. I said, oh, I invest this time and energy. Because what happened was that uh, when Cartier Bresson made the photo, it was all open. You know, it, 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 people weren't thinking about, I guess, suicides or people falling, okay? In modern times, the um, city of Paris um, basically, um, you know, put up these metal protective bars, maybe about, I don't know, so much apart, maybe eight inches, seven inches apart in square, which would be, I guess, an anti-suicide or somebody falling, okay? But the selfie photographers basically ruined it for everybody, okay? Because you got up there and there were these signs in French and English, no selfie sticks, say interdit, okay? And then what you had in front of the wide metal ones to protect the human body, was a much narrower nylon mesh like that. So it's kind of a moral of the story of, you know, uh, a sign of our times, you know. But, you know, I, I actually kind of like this version as well because it's, it's very real. Um, and basically, I just want to end uh, the presentation by saying a few things about um, basically about Paris and, and everything that's happened, you know. Um, I've always been attracted to, to urban spaces, uh, both in my life and, and my photography, and I've been fortunate to have lived and studied and worked in some very different and wonderful cities, including London, New York, Rio, Miami, and now for almost six months a year, Paris. So I consider Paris another home for me. And as you all know, Paris was rocked by terrorist attacks for two years in a row. Uh, in 2014, the Charlie Hebdo newspaper staff and a few days later, a kosher food store were targeted. Um, last winter in 2015 was another series of attacks on the restaurants in the 11th uh, arrondissement and at a rock concert nearby. So, uh, Many people and friends have been asking me about Paris. You know, uh, how is the mood? How are the people taking it? You know, do I feel safe? And I would only say this, that most of the people that I know and meet there um, are very resilient, and that uh, the best way most people respond to this is really to continue what has made Paris such a uh, special place by spending leisure time on the terraces of the cafes and, you know, bistros and eating and drinking, conversing and doing really what they always do. You know, life has to go on. So I'd like to end it on um, two shots that I took. Uh, I went in 2014 after the horrible attacks on the Charlie Hebdo and the kosher supermarket to the uh, Je suis Charlie manifestation at the uh, Place Republique. And I'm not sure the exact amount, but it was said it was maybe 750,000 to a million people. There were a lot of people. It was wall-to-wall -wall people, but it was very, very uh, moving to be there. 
and really take part in it. And this last year, uh, some days after the horrible attacks in 2015, I was walking uh, with the intention of photographing maybe some of the flowers and everything uh, that people placed at the statue at the uh, Place de Republique. But really, I found this, the shot, um, it was a rainy day, and I came across this incredible banner, and basically, this is the, um, <clears throat> this is the, uh, you know, the, the motto of Paris, uh, fluctuant name mergatur, basically tossed, but not sunk. So, I basically leave you with that. And uh, thank you. Thank you.